Um, I'm, I'm Adam Kazari. I'm head of digital at the audience agency. To describe myself, I'm a white male uh, with brown hair and a bit of a comb over and a beard wearing a green jumper. Let's get into what you're all here for today, which is creating digital content that engages communities. Now, I imagine a lot of you are here because getting people to engage with content is actually very difficult. But communities, we often understand. We work with them in other contexts. They're often our primary audiences, and we'd like to give them what they want. And we'd always like to be in part of a community because all of us are part of communities. And this talk isn't going to be about how to actually design content. You can take any number of other courses on writing, graphic design, and video. Those are definitely skills you need. But what I'll be talking about today is how to take the best of content design and community engagement together. The idea for the talk, it's half come out of the pandemic where we all did a load of digital stuff. A lot of teams are now more interested in doing digital content, but a lot of organizations I work with and have worked for in the past have struggled to know how to break through to people, how to know what to post on and how to resource it. So what I'm gonna talk through today won't be brand new thinking to a lot of you because it's really about just talking to people in the communities, focusing on the audiences that matter to you and using that content to fulfill whatever your mission is. But I do want to put in a caveat that I'm not a community engagement specialist. Digital content, digital engagement specialist maybe, but in terms of on the ground and um, in-person community engagement, not so much. So some of what I say may not be drawing from work being done at the moment and current expertise. And as I've worked on this talk, I've worried I've fallen into the trap sometimes that you know, cultural capital and access is something benev benevolently bestowed and still controlled by cultural organizations. So if anything in here is clunky, maybe even outdated, then I'd really appreciate being called out on it so I can improve. But really the whole thrust of this is that I think digital content should be a tool of community engagement. Um, it can't just sit by itself doing its own thing. It needs to serve the purpose of the whole organization. So what that actually looks like in terms of what I'm talking about today is a bit of an overview of how we normally do content, some thoughts on relevance and something called culture 3.0, um, which is not as naff as it sounds. And then a walk through the kind of co-creative approach, which I think could be helpful in creating content for communities with some examples, and then we'll finish. Like I say, I hope you with some time for a question and answer. So in my career, I've always believed in three things. That engagement isn't just marketing. That digital analytics is designed to cause nervous breakdowns. And that the inevitable heat of the universe makes everything we do meaningless. So we should try to have fun while we can. Now this talk will really focus on those first two and a bit more of the first than the second, but a little on digital analytics because working with communities is often very specific and localized and it's at odds with our usual tendency with digital content to always be aiming for kind of exponential growth in reach and engagement. Now, from my experience in my own career and working with other organizations, a lot of content tends to follow this sort of process. Like we're doing a thing, we're putting something on maybe in our program, um, an event, an exhibition, performance, whatever it might be, and we're just doing something. And then we realize, oh God, we need to get people to do that thing. So we put something on social media, ideally to get them to do the thing. And then we realize, oh God, again, we aren't doing enough things to talk about on social media. We can't just keep telling people to come and do these things that we're doing. So we end up maybe coming up with some sort of content plan and or flying by the seat of our pants and hoping for the best. And that'll kind of do. Which isn't really fair, I'm sure, to a lot of you. Some of you may think very deeply about the place of content and what it achieves. Some of you work this way because there's simply too much to do because you're juggling a million things. And I've definitely worked in this way in the past. But when it comes to content, we need to be thinking more at the stage. So organizations which leave digital content solely to marketing, just telling people that we've done a thing or they should be doing this thing that we're putting on and missing a trick. 
And I don't say that because marketing is a bad use of digital content, because it's in fact a very good use of digital content and very effective at what it does. But digital content can be so much more than that. And when we're talking about engaging with communities, we're talking about satisfying all of their various hopes and desires and problems and things that they just want to spend their time looking at and engaging with, which isn't necessarily all about our events program or um, the kind of content, the generic content we produce. It needs to be more specific. So how can we create content that isn't trying to appeal to the whole internet, but to serve a specific community? And I'm also keeping the definition of community kind of intentionally vague, but in my mind, I see it as you know, a collection of people with a shared characteristic or interest. Ideally, they're pre-existing and organized to an extent. So you're not just saying all 17 year olds, you're talking about local groups who are already kind of a bit coalesced. Like I said at the beginning, if my, if my conception of a community is way off base, this is where you need to tell me. And in a sense, doing this kind of content isn't rocket science. You need to know what is useful and interesting to your community and meet that need. And there are broadly two ways, in my opinion. One is fairly hands-off, relying on data and secondhand research to figure it out. I'll be talking about that approach first. Um, and then I'll be talking about a more co-creative approach. Take so the first kind of classical approach of digital content. You start usually by defining your audience and your objectives, classic audience development. And at this point of the presentation, I should probably say that I like circles in my presentation, but I think these actually might be the last circles. Once you've defined your audiences, you try and segment them and split them into recognizable groups, whether that's people with shared characteristics, demographics, geography, behaviors or interests, whatever's useful for your organization. And creates personas, so uh, fictional people who represent different groups in your audiences, different segments, so that you have something useful. You have got you've got a persona that says, say, Jeff who represents this segment of our audience, who goes on these social media channels. He uses the internet for these reasons. This is um, the kind of media he looks and listens at, where he gets his information from, what he's trying to get out of life. And then you use those kind of personas and segments and um, create ideas to say, well, this suits Jeff, this piece of content, or we know that this group of people is interested in this kind of thing, we'll create that content. Which you then publish, you evaluate whether it did what you hoped it would do, and then you do it all over again. This isn't a bad system. In fact, it's a necessary system, because one of the issues with content is that it can be scattergun. But by understanding your audiences better, you can know where to concentrate your efforts. You can form hypotheses based on what you know of your audiences and your content um, and test those hypotheses. It's also the best option for when you have a very clearly defined primary audience, particularly those based around an, an interest. Um, like I don't know if you know the Tank Museum, who've leaned in very hard on pleasing their tank nerd community which obviously spans a lot of different demographics, but they're all unified by being tank nerds. And um, building a Patreon model for it, so people can pay to be, to join a tiered membership with different perks and benefits, um, all based on tanks. Or the Royal Institute, which have built their YouTube channel on scientific talks and experiments into a self-sustaining model. So they can actually afford to run their YouTube channel just by, um, the money that it brings in through advertising. And this is generally the model most of us in digital content work in. You can't talk to absolutely everyone, but you can gauge interest in particular topics or formats. You can test your hypotheses and you can keep evaluating and improving. And we will always need to do this um, because as I'll go into, we can't dedicate all of our time talking to every community to figure out what works best. We need some economy of scale. But there's also a risk working in this way that you're trying to appease a broad group of people rather than a specific community. And if you're working purely just off, say, data, then um, and not talking to real people, 
you're kind of missing a bit of, there's a bit of a missing gap between people's actions and what they're actually interested in. Because this content is still largely broadcast and receive. Like I said, that's not a bad thing if it's something your community or audience want to receive. But I'm interested in this talk about how we use digital content as an active tool for community engagement from the start, which is a bit more niche and specialized. It means that digital content is considered at, say, a start of a project that you're doing with the community or as part of your wider audience development. And that means the content you come up with could be a variety of different things, depending on your community. But the key thing is we're not making assumptions. We're actively working with the community on those ideas. And the kind of content I'm thinking of is very targeted and because it's not meant to please everyone. That means exponential growth isn't always essential or even desirable. I think when you're doing digital content, you're assuming that you have to be reaching thousands of people or growing your audience to be thousands of people. When in fact, if you know you're just trying to serve this one community, you can focus on that and um, evaluate your success based on that rather than aiming for the moon. And I think half of this comes from when we post content, particularly on social media, we're very aware that it can be seen by everyone. And it makes us think that or it makes us assume that we have to please everyone. But like the Tank Museum and the RA show, focusing on your niche can often bring the best results. I don't particularly care for tanks, not since I was like 12 years old anyway, um, or even science comms. So I don't follow the RA or the Tank Museum, but the people who are interested obviously do. And that's where I want to bring in Nina Simon and her work on relevance. You may already know Nina Simon's story. If not, she has some very good TED Talks and a book. Um, but she became the director of the Santa Cruz Museum of Art and History. It, when she joined, it was on the ropes. It was irrelevant to its community. It was facing a black hole in its finances. And that's because they weren't relevant to their community. They weren't visiting. They're often unaware the museum even existed. So they had to listen to their community, what was important for them, and to build doors into the museum that fitted that relevance. And I love this idea that she has that you have to avoid marketing doors because marketing can sometimes give the appearance of a door. So they're saying we are this type of organization and we do this kind of thing. But when people then try and go through that door, they realize it was a fake door, that it was selling something that doesn't exist or doesn't actually persist beyond a particular project perhaps. And this is why I think it's key that we need to start considering digital content at the start. It can't stand aside from the organization and present a face of that organization online, which doesn't match reality. So I think a lot of what I'm saying here is it's not just creating content that kind of leeches from what we do in our projects and our work, but it's something that we consider from the very beginning and the content comes out of doing the work as you go. Like as an example of that fake marketing door, you could say position yourself as an LGBTQ, LGBTQ plus ally online for your content, taking part in Pride Day, that kind of thing. But then perhaps platform artists who are anti LGBTQ plus in your galleries. So your doors can't just be virtual ones. They should be consistent with what your organization does as a whole. And I think this is what we're all grappling with. And there's enough of it, really. Digital content shouldn't just be a shallow front for your organization, only communicating what you've done or you're doing. It should truly reflect what you do, who it is for, and why it is important. And I really like this idea of culture 3.0, an idea from Europeana's Pierre Luigi Sacco. Um, every organization I think has chafed with how to adapt to online communities and content. And a lot of that is down to two things for me. One, that we need to accept that we are not the authority and that we exist in an ecosystem. And two, that we often use digital content only as a marketing tool rather than as a living, breathing engagement tool. Because the internet and new technologies have empowered individuals and communities to create their own spaces, have their own conversations and make their own money, bypassing traditional cultural institutions entirely. You can see it in how local history Facebook groups often have vast, vastly more followers than cultural institutions. Um, 
you can see and help people challenge and fact check the tweets of cultural organizations you can see in indie web comic curators kind of disdained by the art world for creating their own following and fortunes or youtube creators or crafts people on etsy or blogs exploring black art history because institutions weren't exploring it you get the idea sorry just had a sausage sandwich um so it's easy to fall into the trap that we should control digital content too that we call all the shots and present it to audiences whether they like it or not but we don't have to be in control here in fact in a lot of cases we need to be equals facilitating and supporting so i mean it's treating our digital presence and content as a community asset not something that we wholly control essentially it's folding digital content into how a lot of our, a lot of areas of our organizations already work in partnership with communities, artists, and audiences, and as that kind of true public forum and asset. So on that theme, now I'll stop mapping on about what is essentially theory. This is actually the more practical bit. What we're really talking about here is co-creation and human-centered design. And I hope none of you are now groaning because this has essentially turned into a co-creation webinar. But I don't see too much around about applying the principles to content, even though there's a lot of overlap in how we think of content um, and in human-centered design. But it's usually one step removed, that we're only analyzing the data we get from Google Analytics or social media, rather than directly from audiences. So full disclosure, I've pilfered a lot of this from the very good field guide to human-centered design, which is a free handbook from the IDEO. Um, but we've often tweaked the approach and taken bits and bobs and applied the principles in a couple of projects, which I'll be sharing as I go. But first, the types of co-creation is contributory, which is mainly consultation, uh, limited contribution from the community, no decision-making capacity. There's collaborative, where you're working with others to produce something, but your staff kind of stay in overall control. It's co-creative, where the community defines the goals in the outset, working with you to implement them. And it's hosted, where essentially you hand over full control to the community. And I'll mainly be talking about these two in terms of content, because contributory is essentially a bit like the classic approach, where you're mainly getting your audience insights um, from how people already interact with you and your contents. Um, and hosted is obviously very difficult unless that's the way that your organization already works. But what is crucial in these two is actually talking to and involving people and not even at a huge scale. It's getting in touch by email, it's having a coffee, it's emailing a teacher, you know, so long as there's a community voice in what you're doing, it's better to start somewhere than to get it perfect. So the workflow I'm about to go through can be mixed up with communities involved at different stages depending on what you're trying to do. And the first thing I always start with is defining the problem you're trying to solve. Presumably there's a community you want to support or parts of your program or content aren't as effective as you like, or you may have a specific project with its own objectives where digital content could be a useful tool. So it's not the main point. You're not doing a digital content project, but digital content could be part of the solution. You then need to dig a bit deeper into this problem and try and frame it as a design design question. So how do you solve this problem for what community? Like, how do we create a sense of place for the people of Reading, which is where I live? Or how do we use our platforms to provide young people with a voice? Or very simply, how do we work with this community to create content that's useful to their lives? Whatever's driving you. But then it's time to examine that design question. Why are you doing it? What are the kinds of impacts you hope to have by solving this problem? To take the previous example, uh, why would you want to provide platforms to provide young people with a voice? Is it to increase their well-being? Um, is it to promote their agendas and make them feel like they have a voice? What is the impact both for you and for your community? And this is where the classic keep asking why is very useful until you get to the core of what you're actually trying to achieve. Once you've got a clear idea, what you're trying to achieve. Now it's time to brainstorm potential solutions to your problem. Some of these may not be at the end stage, like saying, oh, we'll have this content format or this content series, like a feature on your website, online events, social media, whatever. 
you may realize that you first need to understand, say, the lives, aims, and hopes of the community you want to work with, so more of a research phase. You'll also undoubtedly come across some constraints in contact. Um, what are your knowledge gaps? Do you have time and resource issues, perhaps even hard technical barriers? But once you've explored all of these things, um, it's time to go back to that design question. Does it still make sense? Does it reflect the impact you want to achieve? Uh, what are the realistic solutions that are available to you and the constraints that you're working in? And depending on the specifics of what you're trying to do, you may be doing this internally as a group. It may be done by a project lead. You could be involving members of the community from the very beginning. And if it's helpful that, uh, and look, I mentioned earlier as a template for this, but I previously just used those kind of questions in brainstorming sessions as well. And um, sometimes I put it in an online form, which only one person has uh, filled out. And then it's led to a conversation where it's taken apart and improved. It all depends on the scope and how much time you've got, essentially. But regardless of what you end up doing the kind of problem you're focusing on, you do need to, to understand your own scope. So who's going to actually be doing the work? It could be one person, it could be various people at different stages, depending on your strengths. And there's also no point getting involved with the community without being clear on what you bring to the table. Are you willing to offer your channels, your expertise, equipment or spaces for that eventual content? How much time do you have? What will your milestones be? It's classic project management, really. And it all depend on the problem you're trying to solve. But it's better if you're thinking of actively engaging communities with what you're doing to be very upfront about what you can actually do and achieve. Once you've got that sorted, it's then time to actually talk to people. Even if you've already involved people when defining your design question, um, because now you're working on exploring the community better and finding solutions. Um, primarily through individual and group interviews, I found most useful but also understanding it's not just about saying, uh, can we do, how do we make a good Facebook post? It's trying to dig a bit deeper into actually what makes the community tick. So, um, and saying more about them, their lives and their interests. What do they enjoy in general? What is useful? Um, what could you offer in their lives? It's not just focused on digital behavior or consumption, because remember, digital content is a tool which could be supporting anything from well-being, um, telling stories important to the community, meeting or meeting very specific needs. Um, and digital content may just be one tool as part of a wider project, remember? Um, but here I'm talking about using digital content as something to use as a contributing part of a project, not just communicating what happened after a project is finished. But depending on your community, you also need to consider relevant factors which may impact, say, accessibility and um, how you design your session and where and how you meet. If you begin with a group session, it's usually fertile ground for then identifying individuals for follow up one to ones. Um, but you should come armed with conversation starters, depending on your project. If we're talking about content, then it might be the entertainment they consume, what is important to them, what kind of content appeals to them online, anything which just gives you a bit more context about where you might be able to fit in because you're not necessarily coming up with solutions at this stage you're just trying to find out more about the community and their needs and you might also run brainstorms and um, sometimes even just having people collage about their lives can open up conversations but remember you're at the broad part of the funnel at the stage you're trying to understand the community what is important to them how they behave we should establish some rules for your brainstorm i mean it's the classic ground rules like encouraging wild ideas, uh, making sure people build on each other's ideas rather than shooting them down, stay focused on the topic. But depending on your approach, you may have already brought in members of the community to define your design question. Um, but here's where you might give more agency around that design question as well to revisit it. But once you've done your brainstorms and talked to your community, it's about making sense of it, of it all. Um, it's worth having a lot of people involved, including people from the community, do a download of everything you've learned on post-its and then try and sort them into themes. Based on those themes, you can come up with insights, essentially what are these thoughts and themes telling us, where might it lead, what's coming top of your head when you see all this stuff in front of you. And I've also found it helpful to turn these insights into how might we questions. 
to spark other conversations. So say this community doesn't have a space in which to meet and convene, how can we help them? Or this community group has a ton of knowledge, but no way of communicating that knowledge. Could we give them some skills and um, advise them on setting up a website, do a partnership project? Or these young people have creative ambitions, but no outlet. Can we get them to take over our channels, that kind of thing? And to help with this again, you could still do some more classic brainstorming. Um, but I think at the end, you'll need that prioritization. Choose the top five ideas, vote on the best. You could come up with voting criteria if you like. Um, but some of these ideas may sink or swim. It's all a very iterative conversational process. But in terms of running your project, whatever it might be, uh, we always recommend prototyping. You may have a grand idea, but you don't need to jump in feet first. There could be a way of trialing something first, evaluating it and iterating from there. Um, as an example, I've been working recently with Museums and Galleries Edinburgh. So they wanted to support their formal education offer. Um, but they knew that schools are facing funding cuts, but also that pupils' digital expectations were very high. So they were using school loans boxes with paper sheets, with activities and extra information, and realizing they kind of needed to up their game. So they had this grand idea of shooting videos of staff um, doing uh, talking about the objects, but also doing explaining activities they could then do in the classroom. But that was quite epic. So as a minimum viable product, they instead started with a PowerPoint because they'd involved teachers and pupils already. They'd talked to the teachers, realized that not all teachers were tech savvy and school IT equipment sometimes couldn't handle anything more complicated than a PowerPoint, but also their own constraints as an organization. They couldn't commit time on videos and building up the offer without first testing the water. So their, their original solutions after community consultation gradually boiled down to this, let's test this and then go from there. And the beauty of content, obviously, is that you can keep iterating and changing things as you go, whether your idea ends up as a content theme, a different formats, a hybrid event, whatever happens. But you should hone the idea into a project. Um, if you've had a minimum viable product or a prototype, which you feel like is good enough to make into a proper thing, give it a roadmap, give it a defined life. Um, when do you hope to launch a project? How do you run it and finish it? What preparation is involved? How are you working with the community? Whatever elements of the project or your wider work is it dependent on? And also, how do you define the success of the project? Is that in terms of well-being, engagement among, the, among a specific group? Um, is it done by surveys or digital analytics? Or just follow-up chats? And then once your project is finished, leave some time to consider how to grow that concept um, or the relationship with your community, how you might how might you embed that relationship or extend it? Could you apply the same product or approach to different audiences? Could you build on what you've already done and just enhance it? You can use this uh, diagram called a ways to grow framework, looking at whether you're looking at ex existing or new offers and existing or new users, and who you think it might be appropriate for. Now, I've been intentionally vague throughout this and what type of content you may come up with. And that's because it all depends on your communities, but also what you're trying to solve. Um, I promised some examples. So we, we used a similar approach, not exactly like the one that I've outlined here, but a similar approach in our NLHF funded project, Digitally Democratizing Archives, which asked how or if digital technology can bring communities and archives closer together as a kind of problem statement and design question. It involved a mixture of archives and community groups, um, exploring different forms of digital archives and content, just to cherry pick three. Um, South London collaborated with their own youth forum, Art Assassins, to explore local colonial history and ended up publishing, uh, doing a research project and publishing the results on Wikimedia. So giving the students both research skills, but also publishing it online for everyone to see. Spectacle Media, or a media company, but have been working in the Silwood Estate in London, um, shooting their own videos for about two decades about life in the estate. And they're at a point of wanting to share and celebrate their archive with the community. So they set up workshops where they could watch, comment on, and edit the, uh, the resulting videos. So involving 
the people who the videos were of and most directly affected actually enhancing and contributing to that archive. And any surrounding of Yorkshire Council, the archive there, and wanted to record the experience of young people in the pandemic, but in a format they were comfortable with and knew they would use. So they ended up creating a world in Minecraft, which children could use to record and build their own memories. So back to this. And I want to be clear here about the limitations of this approach and my own expertise. Don't know if I'm caveating all of this too much, but I have said I'm not a community facilitator or expert, but I have a lot of experience in content. And while content and social media are powerful tools for marketing, we're missing a trick by not including digital tools and content in how we engage with communities. And I think it's involving them and is how we end up with the content, which, well, the whole point of this talk is how we engage with them. But we're not guessing at what they're interested in. It needs to be taking some of the best practice of our areas of our work. And in the kind of process and projects I've described, digital content isn't even necessarily the main focus. And you may be discussing a variety of things with community groups that doesn't even end up as content, but in other forms of work. But this is a way of keeping the door open to it and making sure that digital content is meaningful rather than just telling people something happened. And that doesn't mean we need to worry about huge impressions or engagement because we're using digital content as a specific tool for a specific purpose with a community. And a work should be judged on whether it achieves the objectives of that work. And ultimately, the heat death of the universe will be the end of us all anyway. So we shouldn't worry about doing the perfect thing or getting the most retweets, but we should try and be fun and useful for the communities we serve while we can. <laughs>